Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to Boston University and Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. My name is David Chard. I'm the dean and a professor of special education here at Wheelock. Uh, we're particularly excited this year, of course, to be back live, um, masked or unmasked, your choice, but um, it's good to be in person with people and to have an opportunity to share the work that um, our faculty, our students, our alumni and partners are doing in the area of education and human development. A little bit about the history of this um, event. Uh, for many years, we offered a spring event to draw attention to the work um, that the former historic Wheelock College produced, and we invited partners and alumni to join us for that event, and it was an annual spring event in, um, in, uh, in our history. And we decided to bring that along with us in the new Wheelock College, and are really um, interested in highlighting the work of our researchers, our uh, practice partners, our faculty who work in um, preparing professionals and um, sort of illuminating the work that we're doing um, across the community. We also want this to be an opportunity to sort of build and extend our community and to invite more partners and friends and supporters um, to understand the work that we're focused on, to learn more about the questions and work that you're doing and to try to contribute to a broader dialogue on uh, important topics of our day. This year, um, and uh, it kind of following last year's format, we invited one of our research centers to co-host the event with us. Last year, we co-hosted it with the, uh, the focus was on early childhood development, a legacy area for uh, Wheelock College, and we co-hosted it with the Center on the Ecology of Early Development and Dr. Stephanie Currenton and her team. This year we've turned to focus on uh, education policy, and I am grateful that the Wheelock Educational Policy Center, under the leadership of Megan Combe, its executive director, and Marcus Winters, our faculty director, agreed to help us put together this um, this forum, and I suspect Megan has worked as hard on this as almost anything else she's done in her um, important career, and we're thrilled at the turnout. More than 400 registrants, either live, live stream, or tomorrow virtually, so we're really pleased with the, with the turnout. And this year is really focused on um, our strategic goals as a college, which is about system transformation. And so you'll see a theme across both days that focuses on um, the system of teacher workforce, teacher employment. Um, and the framing of this event was really around how, what looked like individual decisions by teachers to either enter the workforce or leave the, step out of the workforce um, that we could interpret had something to do with COVID and other reasons may also be impacted by the broader context of policy, um, policy at various system levels, and how we need to think about disrupting those systems and think about improving policy that um, benefits our uh, society through the recruitment, retention, and support of teachers. This afternoon, we will focus on um, starting at the national level with our keynote speaker and then uh, moving down to focus on a Massachusetts-specific focus. And then tomorrow, as we move virtually, we will talk about um, policies that differentially impact teachers who serve vulnerable populations, students with disabilities, English learners, and others. I was um, preparing some notes for today's um, introduction of our first speaker, and I think I've known um, Kate, or worked with her for 25 years, I think, um, serving on the National Council for Teacher Quality Advisory Board at one point, and really um, uh, watching from afar as Kate has created a, um, I think, a focus on teacher quality unrivaled by any other outside agency. Kate Walsh has served as the president of the National Council on Teacher Quality since 2003 driven by the belief that relevant, broadly accessible comparative data on tra uh, can transform teacher quality. Kate has spearheaded efforts to instill greater transparency and higher standards among those institutions that exert influence and authority over teachers 
Act uh, specifically states, districts, and teacher preparation programs. She is a relentless advocate for equitable access to great teachers and a national thought leader on many of the policies shaping the quality and diversity of our workforce. So uh, please join me in welcoming Kate Walsh. Thank you, David, and it is a great joy to see you again. It's been way too long. Put all my gear here. Um, I've been thinking a lot this week that the actor Will Smith serves as, serves as a great metaphor for our times. We've all had to learn to navigate a new world order these days where once taboo behaviors are now accepted as the cultural mainstream. Much of what is going on, I profess, is beyond my own understanding. Perhaps that's why I'm about to step down from my role at NCTQ, better to leave to others to try and navigate. In about a month, I'll be passing the bat baton to Heather Pesky, who's with us today. Um, and she has been such a gift to the Commonwealth that we thought that the nation could benefit from her relative youth and wisdom as well. So thank you, Heather. <laughs> to be clear, though, not all of this new world order is a bad thing. Yes, Will Smith did march up onto the Oscar stage and slap another man in the face. And he also won the Best Actor Award, something I had thought he richly deserved, and that only a few years ago was a pretty rare occurrence for a person of color. This social disruption, whatever its source, COVID, racial politics, George Floyd, what have you, has of course spilled into all aspects of our lives. How people drive, though I think some Boston drivers may have been ahead of their times, and it's certainly spilled over into our schools. And how could it not? The teaching profession, in particular, is in turmoil, roiling from the most disastrous couple of years in the history of public education. Might I suggest that in many respects, schools have made a really awful situation even awfuler. With our D-Day moment amounting to little more than improvements to HVAC systems. Many of the problems that the teaching profession appears to be experiencing are designed to incite fear and panic rather than thoughtful, constructive solutions that serve the interests of children. We human beings certainly do seem to enjoy a good panic, don't we? A lot of what's being said about the turmoil that teachers are in right now isn't even true, or at least not altogether accurate. However, I've decided that the truth doesn't matter all that much here only what most of us perceive to be the truth. Let's just assume there's an element of truth to the daily barrage of stories about the crisis that the teaching profession is facing, that much of what we're hearing is at least directionally true. I think I've got time to address just three specific areas which have profound implications for the immediate and the future health of the teaching profession, and of course, of students. First, the decline in the interest in teaching. Second, teacher shortages. And third, some of the policy changes enacted by states in the name of diversifying the teaching profession. First, I'd like to discuss what appears to be the sharp decline in the interest in teaching. Even before the pandemic, 
there was a significant drop in the number of individuals who pursued a teaching career. It's alarming. In Massachusetts, I believe enrollment has gone down by about 15% over the last decade, though that's still much better than the national average, which stands at a drop of 35%. Even more concerning is who is choosing not to teach. While there's little hard evidence to go by here, I suspect that the decline reflects the profession's failure to attract the college students we need most to attract. Those students who are themselves decent students and whom we know from quite a bit of research are the most likely to have the greatest impact in the classroom. These are the same students who happen to also have a lot of other career prospects. This problem is particularly concerning regarding talented students of color who now have many, many opportunities in the workforce and who are more likely to be saddled with debt and whose parents are urging them to choose a more lucrative, high-status profession. College students of color have been entering teaching at a rate that is about a third below that of white college students, and that's been true for quite a while. In spite of the millions now being invested by philanthropy and even the federal government to recruit more teachers of color, I worry that this gap still might get worse or that we will only largely succeed in attracting candidates of color with few other career options. I hope I am proven wrong. Teacher pay is, of course, the big elephant on the table. But to mix a few metaphors here, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem with teacher pay. We can't have it both ways. We can't make the profession open to any and all, regardless of attributes, when we fail to assert that there is a body of knowledge that teachers need first to acquire before entering the classroom, when we ignore that there are skills every teacher needs to master, like teaching children how to read and then also expect the American taxpayers to open up their wallets. Unfortunately, a bachelor's degree does not provide as much assurance of candidate preparedness as we might all like to think. Speaking generally, and I emphasize generally, the education major is not known for its tough admission policies or its rigor. In a study we completed several years ago called Easy A's, we found that in two thirds of the institutions where teachers are prepared, it was the students majoring in education who graduated with honors at twice the rate of any other major on a campus. If we want to attract individuals who will really add value to the classroom our teacher preparation programs, our state policies, as well as our district hiring practices must reflect that teaching is a profession that requires both knowledge and strong clinical preparation over an extended period of time. By no means am I arguing that the profession should become elitist. We're a far, far cry from that. It does need to signal that there's work to becoming a teacher, that it is a genuine accomplishment to complete a program of study and qualify for a teaching license. Only then are we likely to improve teacher pay, but we can't have it both ways. Let me turn next to a topic that is very much top of mind, the worry that teachers are quitting in droves. You no doubt may have seen a number of high profile news articles announcing that teachers are quitting. However, those articles 
played fast and loose with the facts, mostly because there aren't any facts on which to build such a claim. Neither the federal government nor do most states collect the data that would be necessary to make that assertion. And the few that do collect that data can only tell us what happened last year, not this year. Massachusetts is beginning to report vacancy data and now has online data about last year's resignation rate, which I hope will be soon updated with the work that a couple of folks here are doing. And we're gonna hear about some of that work later on after my talk, showing real-time data about what is happening in this state. Looking nationally, I think it is still safe to say that there is something going on. There's, though there's not any substantial evidence of teachers taking part in any, man, in any major way, what is called the Great Resignation. It's important to point out that some of what's going on here is a reflection of quite a few jobs that districts can't fill that were created this year with federal, reco federal recovery money. How much these new jobs are a factor in vacancies is hard to say, but districts are struggling to fill these positions. In any case, the heightened attention by the press on this issue has the benefit of getting us all to focus attention on a problem we have long been ignoring. While most school districts have for years had trouble finding certain kinds of teachers, and we've done almost nothing to fix that problem, rural districts have been in crisis mode for decades, long before COVID, trying to find any teachers, even the ubiquitous elementary teacher. Economist Dan Goldhaber studied teacher vacancy rates in California, finding that rural districts in that state have 12 times the vacancy rate of schools located in urban areas. I'm not talking just about suburban, I'm talking about urban. May I suggest that Western Massachusetts is also in this same boat. Rural schools where most children living in poverty reside have been largely neglected, not just by policymakers, but by people like me who like to tell policymakers what to do. I think there's ample evidence before us that we ignore the needs of rural schools and children living in rural areas at this nation's peril. Yet for all the talk, we're still not seeing a sufficient response by states to address their problems. We continue to portray teacher shortages as an issue all districts experience equally. One of the most common solutions put forward by states to teacher shortages is to make it easier for anyone to teach. Many states, California, Delaware, Illinois, Oklahoma, Oregon, Washington, have all decided that they can leave it up to their teacher prep programs to decide if someone is qualified to teach. But I'm not sure that relaxing those entry standards into the profession will do all that much to solve rural teacher shortages. We have no reason to believe that the folks who will now qualify for a teaching license with states having removed certain requirements will be any more likely to go teach in those rural districts than when licensing requirements were a lot tougher. There are alternatives we might consider getting over our love affair with class sizes, for starters. Over the past three decades, we have made some conscious choices to reduce class size, even though these initiatives rarely improve student outcomes. And they have even been found to hurt student learning, most famously in California in the 1990s, when student achievement plummeted because of its class size initiative. Yet lowering class size remains popular with the public and then by association with politicians. 
The reason our love affair with class size is such a problem is that when we reduce class size, we have to hire a lot more teachers. That means states and districts both end up lowering standards to fill classrooms. I wrote in an editorial this month that is posted on the NCTQ website about an array of alternative solutions to shortages. We don't have time today to get into most of them, but just a few thoughts here. The top priority for states is to determine where shortages actually exist. Without real data, it is impossible to design a targeted approach to address true shortages. And by targeted, I mean there has to be money involved. We simply have to pay some teachers to do some jobs in some places that we won't pay other teachers. I would also suggest, which will come to no surprise to anyone that knows me, that we need to do a better job regulating educator prep programs. As Louisiana has done, we need, to, we need to stop rewarding institutions which prepare teachers which don't align to their workforce needs. States shouldn't make it feasible for institutions to ignore the needs of schools. For example, continuing to educate many times more elementary teachers than any schools need and doing little to direct aspiring teachers to areas of greater need. States also need to hold these institutions accountable for low pass rates on state licensing tests instead of blaming candidates for their failure. We all might be surprised at how quickly pass rates would rise when it is, when it is the program and not the candidates in the hot seat. That certainly has happened in the field of nursing when programs were, were required to post their first time pass rates on their own website, something like New Jersey has just started to do as well for its teachers. We could start requiring institutions to pay any candidate's retest fee if they fail the first time. This strategy alone could reduce the disproportionately high number of test takers of color who walk away after failing the test once. Finally, in the last few minutes I have, I'd like to address the issue of teacher diversity. The research findings showing the positive impact to student learning when black students experience black teachers either in their class or simply seeing them in their schools. They're just remarkable. Fewer, but nevertheless promising studies regarding Hispanic students reveal much the same. And although perhaps less quantifiable, there are of course benefits to all children from a more diverse teacher workforce. These relatively new findings are why NCDQ no longer considers teacher quality without also considering issues of diversity. If we want a high quality workforce, it simply must be adequately diverse. But I also have some reservations about how some of the efforts to diversify the workforce are playing out across the country. Much like the state response to teacher shortages, many states have decided that their licensing tests serve as obstacles to diversity. I wonder if parents of color, if they were aware of these policy moves, and no doubt they are not aware, I wonder what they think of this, policies which neglect other important attributes that we all agree teachers need to have regardless of their skin color. I don't know the answer to that because no one has asked these parents. I do know that it is not something that teachers support, including teachers of color. They overwhelmingly believe that licensing tests serve as a relevant metric to their preparedness. Not the most relevant, but it is relevant. I also think that teachers get the importance of the profession maintaining clear and strong standards. Here's what matters most. 
We know from many studies, but particularly from the great work that's recently been done in Massachusetts, that the licensing tests in this state do indeed predict future teacher effectiveness. They are no less predictive for teachers of color than white teachers, in spite of a common assertion that the tests are biased. For years, states have watched passively while institutions that they approve to operate can barely get 50%, 30%, or even 10% of their candidates of color to pass their licensing tests. We looked at what those programs are doing by way of preparation, and it is no wonder the results that they get. Yet states are not holding these programs accountable. Programs rarely direct candidates to take the coursework that would allow them to do well in these tests. In fact, programs often disparage the tests and tell their students that they are unimportant. I have one additional concern before I close. I'm also concerned about the overly ambitious expectations for what it would mean for the teacher population to be considered adequately diverse that setting as the goal parity between teachers and students is just not realistic, even if we try to achieve it by the year 2060, which we've modeled out, and it's not. While ambitious goals serve a purpose, they need to be achievable. Consider this. The teaching profession is currently 18% of color. The student population is 51%, so that is a very big gap indeed. Yet the broader adult population isn't 51% of color. It is only 27% of color, far wider than the picture of younger America. The gap we can actually expect to close is closer to about a 10% gap, not a 33% gap. A realistic and important goal for us to achieve is to ensure that the teaching profession is as diverse as the adult population, unless, of course, we want to start letting children start teaching courses. In closing, I recognize that the most unpersuasive argument that you can make to many education audiences is to cite international data or the practices of other nations. I was figuring Massachusetts was one place I might come and think I might encounter a different dynamic, a belief that the, that the United States can learn from the hard scrapple lessons learned by other nations like Singapore, Finland, Poland, Vietnam, and others, which understood that an effective teacher workforce must remain our primary focus if we are to do right by students we all profess to serve. That may not conform to the narrative that is being told in many school board meetings and in state legislatures, but the lessons of these other nations are indeed, and indeed actually what has gone on in Massachusetts for the past several decades, help to explain my resolve here. Thank you for your attention.